Let me think of a nice, decent question, shall I? First of all, Shay, how, how did you get started in football? Just as a kid, really, in the front garden, we brothers, we've got four brothers, so we used to play about in the front garden. My dad used to be a goalkeeper as well, so probably must be in the blood, I think, and uh, I used to go and watch him play, and then obviously going up to the underage groups and uh, just the local team, really. So who did he play for? Just teams in Donegal back in Ireland, you, you wouldn't have heard of them, like, but just junior clubs, you know, and um, we'd all go on a Sunday as a family and, and, and watch yeah. him play. So when when you started out, did he give you tips, or was he one of them dads that just left you alone? No, he was. He was. He was sometimes standing behind the goal, sometimes, and you know, he would be fair. He was there trying to help and stuff, and um, obviously, I think he's stood me in good stead, you know. Because we will obviously have a lot of readers whose sons are now playing in goal, mm -hmm. and obviously trying to make make that thing where you say, <coughs> "Do I go and watch him? Yeah. And do I criticise him? Do I stand behind the goal and shout at him?" Yeah. See, my dad, when my dad come to me, he just left me alone and just drove off. Yeah. I think he was trying to get rid of me, to be fair. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's striking a balance, you know, because as a player or a goalkeeper or whatever, it's like the last thing you want is your, your parent on touchline going nuts and going crazy. You should be doing that. You should be doing something else, you know. Mm. For me as a parent, I think the biggest thing would be encouragement, you know, whatever you do and try and try and be positive as much as you can. You know, some of the parents on the touchline, you watch some of the kids' games nowadays and it's like, you know, you just want to mm, get hold good. of them. You yeah. know what I mean. But it's um, it can be uh, can be tough. Um, but I, I would sort of be sort of in the middle. I wouldn't want to. I'd try like the advice. You know, my son or whatever. Or mm. but I wouldn't want to be in his ear every two minutes. You know. So did he did he did he have a go at you during the match, or did he take your side of the match and go right? I think you should have done this. Son. I think when I was really young, he used to give me advices and when to go and through balls and things. He'd be yeah. shouting, you know, that kind of because you're so young and I suppose you didn't really know where you were in the goal and things mm -hmm. like that and. But then I suppose as I got older, he, he, he sort of eased off a little bit more and would say to me after the game, you know, what could you have done better with a goal or whatever, a cross or whatever, so. So did that make you think on the way on? What, you know, if you're going on from the games, you think, well, do I take that advice in? Because mm. obviously it's your dad. Yeah. And you believe everything your dad says. Yeah, yeah. Did, did you actually sit there and actually you've got a point? Or did you sometimes did you disagree with him? Um, I, I wouldn't have disagreed with him that much because he was quite strict with me that, but... <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the things that would probably score against me that would be he always picked out you know what you did wrong in the game. Yeah. You know, and, and sometimes a lot of people do that. Even coaches sometimes they would they would always pick up on on the, on the negative side of things. Whereas, you know, as a goalkeeper especially, you need to be t be told what you done well as well. Yeah. You know, because even if you make a mistake, you always remember the mistake. But you can make ten unbelievable saves, but people sometimes remember the the mistake, or whatever. You know, it's mm -hmm. important to to keep a nice balance. So, did your brothers play in goal, or were you the only goalie out of the family? I was the only one, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so your dad obviously took more of a shine to you. Well, well not really. I played out the field as well from my school. Yeah. I was top goal scorer from my school, so oh, yeah. I was like a bit of both under 14 levels. Um, and then, but my dad suggested I should stick to the one, you know, because some team was playing out the field, some yeah. teams was in goal, and my dad said you should stick to goalkeeping, and um, I did that, and thankfully it sort of worked out well. So was your dad old school, or was he was he forward thinking, or was he one of them that you could eat what you want, drink what you wanted? Yeah, I mean, where I'm from in Ireland, in Donegal, there was no such thing as nutrition or, no. or healthy eating or anything like that. You, whatever's put down in the table front, you were happy to, to eat, you know. And mm. I mean, it's come on, obviously, that's a long time ago. I'm mm. getting pushing on now, 20 years ago or something. So, but the way the nutrition has gone on now, and, and, the, and the you know the, the 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 sports psychologists and all these different people that are involved in football, I mean, it's it's definitely helped the game. But growing up as a kid, I didn't I didn't have that on board. So do you think it would have made a massive difference to you or do you think it would have made no difference to you? I think it would have helped a bit. I mean the first nutrition thing, the first coaching thing I ever had full time coaching when I was 16 as well. I know kids now get coached from maybe under 10s, under 12s at academies and stuff and you know I think they've got an advantage on me perhaps because the first time I got full time training was when I was 16 you know. So if you can start at a younger level I think you know nutrition and coaching and I think you're going to be you're going to be better. Then. Well do you think your dad's coaching was the equivalent of what they get in the academy now? Um, Probably his advice would, would maybe have been better, but mm. we, we didn't really go out in the garden and do uh, specific goalkeeping drills that you would do. We we just the lads would just lamp balls at me and I'd just <laughs> keep them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Basically, you know. So um, that that was that was the bottom line. But in essence, it's goalkeeping. It is, yeah. As you say, sometimes just keeping the ball in the net doesn't matter how you do it or what you do it with. It's 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 important that you stop the ball. But you 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 know looking at coaching now and coaching what we are then. Mm. Obviously, technically you might have been better. Mm. But well, did it allow you to develop your own style, do you think, before you got picked up by a club? Or would, would you have been regimented in actually other people trying to change your style? Not, 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 not really, no, I don't think I... I think whatever style I have is, is, is a style I've sort of continued, obviously, mm -hmm. tried to improve and work on it every day, but 
no one's ever at any stage in my life and gone saying well, you, you shouldn't be you know whatever diving on your side or on your front or whatever I've, I've kind of basically had a style and I've just tried to improve on what I've you know been gifted with or whatever I've been given as a, as a child really but you know I've seen goalkeepers and I look at your style and you're not six or five yeah so would I coach you the same as I would the coach you six or five goalkeeper possibly not no I mean you know, I always find it strange when you know you speak, listen to commentators and so-called experts, and they talk about goalkeepers. And you know, if you're not six foot five now, then you're not you're not a good goalkeeper. You know, and there's things that that they maybe can do that I can't do, but there's things I can do that they can't do. You know what I mean? So there's no, no. ideal goalkeeper, I would say. So when when you when you when you go on coaching course and do your coaching badges or you do mm -hmm. your coaching with the apprentices here, do you still have that in mind, or do you think, well, I'm going to coach them all the same? We'll do the drills, and the drills will be the drills. Yeah. But you actually, he's six foot five. Yeah. He's four foot seven. Yeah. That's going to be different. Yeah. Would you, would, you know, because I, I looked at the mostly co coaching now, mm -hmm. and it's all blanket coaching. So it's coaching for the goalkeeper, but not specifically yeah, for I think you've got to be size a bit more and style. Specific, because mm. um, we've got a young guy, Benji, and he's like six foot five. Like he's Swiss guy. He's, there's big hopes for him, like you know. But I, I would, as a as a still a player, obviously, I would take him to one side and, and, and tell him a little, few little things that maybe that I would do, but he shouldn't do because mm. of his size, you know. And a lot of things in small side of games, he's trying to save his feet and stuff because he's <coughs> sometimes can't get down and stuff. Mm. And I'm just telling him he's got to get his hands more forward and get and get maybe a bit lower in his stance and things like that because at six foot five is a long way down to get down to your ankles. You know yeah. what I mean? So th there is definitely a coaches in general should be more aware of that. Yeah. So so I mean, they'll have lots of. We have lots of readers, lots of coaches in there mm -hmm. who'll go out and do sessions. Yeah. But not obviously I think, size, I think, and size and style specific. Yeah. What we do, these will be the drills, and this is why we're doing the drills. And that's it, not taking into account what their strengths are. So if you're, for me, it's more natural for you to jump for a high ball. Yeah. There would be somebody at six or five to jump for a high ball. Yeah, yeah. Just because of the, the height that they cross the ball at. Yeah, yeah. Rather than. Yeah, no, I agree, yeah. Um, to be honest, I. The goalkeeper and coaches well, I've got Terry Gennell at the at the club now. He's very good. Mm -hmm. One of the best at work. We had him at, at Blackburn and Newcastle, and you know he's very he's in, the, in depth as well. And mm -hmm. he pulls Benji and different different guys aside at different heights and stances and builds and stuff. And to be fair, we do a lot of the same kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. you can tell him, as I said before, sometimes with height and stuff, he's got to do different things for them. You know, and yeah. it's important that they are coached and told different things rather than as you say, right? You must do that. You must do this. There's no. I don't think there's any perfect way of doing keeping the ball in the net. You know what I mean? Everyone's no. different. But you've got to get the most out of what you've got. Yeah. So, so the first bit is to analyse what you've actually got. Yeah. And then work on that style, that size. Yeah. And that shape. Yeah, yeah. And then fit it to you. Yeah. Rather than do drills just to do drills for the drill's sake. Yeah. And we must have a load of readers who actually go out and be coaching tonight or whenever you get we get the magazine, they see yeah. the interview. Yeah. Just to make them think a little bit of. Doing things differently, so they'll have five or six goalkeepers, or maybe even ten. Yeah. And they'll all be different. Yeah. And while you can do the drills together, you must have some time split it down into individual coaching, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. And, and, and advice as well, which is important. Like when, when you watch them doing things, then I think it's important to pull them to one side and say, well, for example, I can do that, but Benji's six foot five, mm. should maybe do it a different way. You know, there's definitely a, there's definitely room for, for you know, um, Switching it around for for different sizes of goalkeepers. I mean, but coaching in a sense, I think it's as you know, it's it's, it's pretty much of the muchness. But it's it's important, I think, that they get the right advice, especially at a young age as well. Mm -hmm. So, what advice? What, what age would you start giving advice to somebody? Would you start giving it at eight, six? No, I, I I don't think so. I mean, as I said, I didn't get coached till I was sixteen, and I think the younger the the guys are, then I think it takes the fun fun away from it. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a very big believer of. And even now, I still try and go out there and train every day and enjoy it and have a bit of fun. And, and you think you play better when you're more relaxed and you're you're diving into top yeah. corners and you're saying, bloody hell, that was great, you know what I mean? Rather than thinking the pressure, the manager's going to go mad at them, do you know what I mean? I think you've got to really, especially at underage level, you've got to, that's what I said to you before about the parents, sometimes wind you up because they're young kids and they're going out, you know, with your mates more or less playing football yeah. and having fun. And that's what I was trying to get to you before. Did you, did you develop your own style because you weren't coached? Was it, if you were coached? And people would give you advice, you must do it like this, you must do it like that. Yeah. And I've yeah, never really thought about it till you're speaking about it now, but as I say, I wasn't coached full time till I was 16, and I was only one day a week with Joe Corrigan at Celtic, you know, yeah, and it, was, um, it wasn't like now there's every club's got a full time mm -hmm. goalkeeping coach, and, and I suppose I had my own style then, and, and I just tried to improve on that, you know, but 
I think it's important that, as I said, underage is, is to let them, I suppose, express themselves more and see where they're at rather than saying, you must do this, you must do that. I think it's... Yeah, I think sometimes they put constraints on people. Yeah, I don't think I wouldn't agree with that, no. You know, rather than find your own way of doing yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe polish that A little up. tweaks, like, you know, yeah, just rather than saying, rather, you're doing yeah. it totally wrong, you need to do it like this. Because I think at our age, you don't know what you're doing anyway. Mm. And then at 10, mm. and then once you start developing your own style, it'll come yeah. and it'll be a little bit more free, a little bit more easy, a bit yeah. more relaxed. Yeah, you'd be more relaxed than yourself as well. Because if I've got somebody telling me on a Tuesday, I must do this, and I'm trying to implement that on a Sunday, yeah. and I'm finding it difficult. Yeah, you shouldn't be thinking about it on a match day, like you should be. Yeah. You should be comfortable well, on your own, your own think, ability. You know, I just think some coaches will try and make you fit in with them, mm. rather than they fit in with you. Yeah, I understand, definitely. You know, rather than yeah, yeah, do it the other way about. Yeah, so I, agree. I think sometimes you were a late developer like I was. Yeah. You, got, you were 16, I was 20 when I first got mine. Yeah. So I think sometimes you build up that style. You've been through a lot where you've had to make your own decisions. Yeah. And you've had to find your own solutions. Yeah. Well, you haven't had someone to rely on to give you the solutions. Yeah. I'm just wondering if that had a massive effect mentally on you. Yeah, possibly. I don't know. And maybe it's kids nowadays get too much too soon, you know, when you get too much coaching, too much, and, mm. and, the, and the fun sort of is taken away a little bit, I think, maybe. But, I mean, as you know, the, the, the amount of money they're talking about of young players now, and, and if they can mm. get them in at a very young age and improve them, and they're, they're in the first team quicker. and. I suppose that they look at that type of things, but the overall, the overall game and stuff. I just think mm. you, you've got to have fun at, at a young age. Well, you've got fun. When when do you start developing? So you you were quite lucky because your dad was there in the background. Yeah. But didn't force you on you. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't take you out into the garden and say do this, do that. Yeah. So you weren't you weren't under the constraints of somebody else trying to tell you to do stuff. Yeah. So did that make you solve your own problems in your head? So when you think, well, I'll do that next time. If I'm yeah, not sure, I might ask my dad. Yeah. We didn't have someone there all the time to say this, 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 and this. Yeah. So therefore, maybe maybe you solved more problems in your head earlier on, which developed you better from when you did have coaching. Yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't know. It's just that you say you didn't get coached until twenty, and I was sixteen. We did, we didn't know any different, I suppose, at the time. We just this is our life growing up, and mm. and then we got coached from that age, and and hopefully we we both improved, mm. like, but. I just think it's 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 difficult to sit here and say that you should do this and you should do that and you're mm -hmm. doing that wrong. Like any mm -hmm. underage goalkeepers, especially because you know can knock their confidence in with young boys, and it's mm -hmm. difficult to you know if a coach from a professional club tells them that you're doing it totally wrong, then they could go one way and mm -hmm. never be seen again. You know, it's it's about encouraging. Yeah, I was just sort of where that mental development comes from. Mm. Obviously, it's quite a strong character to play as long as you have. Yeah, did that become because early on there was you. Mm. And you solved your own problems, but maybe a little bit of games from your dad. Yeah. Or where where's here and under eight, you're probably getting told this. You must develop like that and done that. Yeah. And you can't quite be what you want to be because you can't be yourself. Yeah, yeah. I don't really know. Is it? I don't know. We've been lucky, I suppose. But you know, I had a tough upbringing as well. We used to work quite hard in the fields and mm -hmm. stuff. So I think that's kind of stood me in good stead throughout my career. Knowing, I think you need a real work ethic to be to mm -hmm. be at the. As you know yourself, to be at the top of your game for for a long period of time, you know, if someone said one says oh, it's okay getting there, but to stay there is the mm. is the more difficult thing, you know. And I know what a hard day's work is, and I know how lucky I am to you know mm. come in every day and train for a couple of hours and whatever, and, and throw myself around playing football. What you mm. what you love to do as a kid, you know, and I'll, I'll never forget that. So when when did you first get your first league club? Then? Um, went to Glasgow Celtic when I was 16, right. so that was the first big move. I was on a few trials in different English clubs as well. And, um, I think I came down to Glasgow Celtic or Manchester United, I was over at Man United for two weeks as well. And my dad obviously he advised me, I think it would be better to go to uh, to Glasgow Celtic. Liam Brady was the manager, and right. felt there was a better chance of you know breaking through to the first team because you know Schmeichel was just coming to Man United mm -hmm. and was really you know a top mm -hmm. top keeper, you know, and we just felt it was the right right sort of mm -hmm. road to take. What was it like there compared to where you've been? Huh. Well, I grew up in the country, in the middle of nowhere, back in northwest of Ireland, you know, and mm. I sh shipped into a city like Glasgow. It's a huge city and really quite frightening, to be honest, and very, very homesick, especially the first year, 18 months, thinking, you know, all my friends and family are at home and I'm sort of stuck in things and thinking, you know, is, is, this, is this really worth it, you know, because you, you're just looking every day to day life and you're not thinking of the bigger picture then. And it's, it's, it was very tough, you know, there's no getting away from that, but. You know, luckily I, I stuck stuck in with it and and and, and still playing today. So was there any major influences that made you stay at Celtic? Um, well, I always supported Celtic as a kid. I suppose that made a help matters. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I just you know I just felt it just felt it was right. You know, I was doing something that 
you know, loads of my mates back home would have would have loved to have done and, and played professional football. So I was that was keeping me going and, and having a chance of, of being a professional football. I was only a, an apprentice at Celtic, so you know, you, you don't make it at sixteen, it's you know, about the years ahead and mm -hmm. I felt that, you know, there's some light at the end of the tunnel and that kept me going from. So before you went, obviously in eighty days, no agents. Yeah. So how did you actually prepare yourself to go there? So obviously it's a big step for you. Yeah. Come from Ireland from nowhere yeah. into a big city. How, how do you actually try and prepare yourself for that? Because obviously there'll be people who read the magazine who might be going to see the same thing. Yeah. No preparation really, to be honest. You know, there's no there was no magic wand and everyone says it's going to be alright. It was just my dad took me over, I think, in the boat in the car and we met the chief chief scout from Celtic and, and we went and met the youth team coach or whatever it was and um my dad stayed a couple of days I think and off he went <laughs> back in the car and pretty much I was sent to a few couple of lads and did digs in, in the middle of Glasgow and and more or less get on with it like you know and there was no there was no preparation I know there's a lot of player liaison officers now at clubs and there's lots of different people that mm. you know maybe help you settle in with what that length of time was it 20 years ago now nearly it was they weren't there you know so mm. it was very much uh, get on with it um, the first digs I went to actually I wasn't impressed at all with it right <laughs> in the city centre and right. I wasn't happy at all and I went to see the manager even at 16 Blaine Brady and it says you know can't stay here because I was it just I was actually quite frightened because I was in the city centre mm. and it was also just a noise at night time. Just that it didn't feel comfortable. And then he goes, right, we'll leave off me. And he, he moved me to an oar digs, which there was an oar lad from Ireland staying in who had a car. Right. We drove and it was a, with a family, and I just felt a lot more comfortable with that, you know. And, and um, I was happy I did go and see the manager, you know. Well, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that shows you want to succeed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thought, and then that because your background, where you were brought up, obviously you've got brothers. Yeah. You've got quite a strong family, you got a voice in that family, or you yeah. travel to death. Yeah, for sure. If you didn't come out fighting then you wouldn't have <laughs> trampled to death and that's even for a slice of toast in the morning. If you didn't get your elbows up you wouldn't have you wouldn't have got fed, I suppose. But no, I mean you've got to keep fighting all the way through and, and to try and be the best you can and you know, nothing comes easy in any walk of life and, and you've got to keep working every day to, to achieve it. So did your goalkeeper improve dramatically at Celtic? <laughs> I think I improved, yeah, I don't know about dramatically, but it, obviously, as I say, it was the first time I got coached mm -hmm. from a proper goalkeeping coach, you know, Joe Corrigan, I'm sure a lot of the readers would have, would have, you know, heard of Joe, obviously, with his playing career and, mm -hmm. and his coaching career at different clubs as well, And but he used to come in only one day a week, he'd come in on a Thursday and, you know, train the first team keepers and, and the young kids like myself, and, um, but it was great to, to work with someone like that, then the other days, and the, the senior goalkeepers would more or less take the sessions, you know. So who was there, it was Packy Bonner? Packy Bonner was there, Gordon Marshall. Mm -hmm. Myself and our guy called Stuart Kerr that people might have read about, he used to yeah. play for Celtic as well. Um, and we all sort of mucked in together. And, um, so physically, mentally, did you develop? Or weren't you aware of your development? Um, I probably wasn't aware of it, but the first year or two I probably took a lot of niggles and stuff. And you know, your body getting used to training yeah. every single day. Then I, you know, I was feeling lots of different things and your body, I suppose, takes a while to harden up to training every day, I suppose. And, you know, that took a bit of a while, having little knocks and bruises and what have you, you know, but um, I suppose that helps you get physically stronger as well and, mm. you know, mentally stronger. I suppose I just, you know, just kept my head down and worked hard. I actually had to go on loan when I was, I think, 18 to Queen's Park, with another team mm. in Glasgow, yeah. because Stuart Carey was a year older, he was playing in the youth team in the reserve, so for me to get some games, I had to go mm. to, to Queen's Park. I still trained with Celtic, but I played at the weekend with Queen's Park. So from working in the fields really hard, yeah. just coming to, well, it's basically, what, two hours a day? Yeah. Obviously, yeah. you know you're physically fit from there. Yeah, it's a totally different type of fitness. Yeah, definitely. Being in goal. Yeah. So when people say they're fit, there's got to be, a, I think, position specific to be fit. Mm, definitely. You know, even now. Yeah. You know the number of people I've had training where you've broken things, yeah. the comfy charity things. You go, yeah, everybody can dive and can do this, but yeah. it's, it's totally different to actually being fit, to being goalkeeping fit. Isn't it? Yeah, totally different. Yeah, I mean, even some of the players in Aston Villa here. They, if you took them out and done a goalkeeping session, they'd be, they'd be breathing heavily at the end of it, like, you know, because mm. it's, as you know, getting up, getting down, the physical side of hitting the ground, that takes it out of you. Mm. So much different training, uh, basic uh, for goalkeeping than it is for, for outfield players. And, you know, people have a perception of just seeing goalkeepers standing in the goal. You don't need to be fit mm. to do that. You don't, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, but there's a lot more behind the scenes that goes on that people don't see. So did your, did your diet improve? Um, Probably didn't really, to be honest. I ate what was at the club and I ate what the, the lady at the yeah. digs put on for me, you know, and I suppose they, they might have been told to eat healthy or whatever or put something healthy on, but... No I Guinness. Didn't, uh, no, no Guinness, no. <laughs> no I, I wasn't told drastically to do, you know, now that we have nutritionists yeah. and all that, we weren't, it wasn't, it was too soon for that, I think. Well, 
But did you did you look into that yourself? Was there anything that you saw outside? Did you think, well, I need to do this. I mean, I need to read this. I need to examine that. I need to research this. Was there anything you did that you not, thought? Not, not when I was young, no. But since that, since like you know, in the last ten, fifteen years, I have I've read into a lot of different things and mm. spoke to sports psychologist, different, just different things to try and help me improve. You know, nutritionists, mm. fitness mm. coaches. I think any player or any goalkeeper, they just got to try and take as much on on board as you can, but not too much. Obviously, you need to keep a clear mind of of, of the mm. basics. Like, but. If nutrition or psychology or reading a book can help you one percent, then you know it's mm. worth doing mm. to improve you. Well, I don't think I do think it is. Mm. Yeah, what else did you do at Celtic? And did you once you got back in to Celtic after loan? Did you stay there, or did you move on? Or I moved on. I was, um, I think it was about four or five of us. They wanted to keep on at the club, um, and it just offers all the same contract, which was which was I was nearly on as much as an apprentice. I know it doesn't come down to money at that age, but mm. you work two years hard. You know, grafting, yeah. grafting, lifting kits, cleaning boots. We actually used to sleep, sweep the stands at Parkhead and everything. So it wasn't just a couple of hours in. You were, you were there all day at the club, and and I just felt that you know that the, the, not disrespect me, but just didn't appreciate me enough. I felt mm-hmm. at the time, and to myself and my dad was just right. We're not signing that contract. They give you, we go home. You know, we go back to yeah. we go back to Donegal, and I, I felt at the time I was going to get another club, and and I, you know I'd done well enough to 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 you know to impress the Celtic guys and. I was home for a month or so, and then um, Kenny the Gleish, you know, called and and mm. um, wanted me to go to Blackburn, which I did, right. <laughs> which was nice. <laughs> yeah, and was it a massive difference between the two clubs? So obviously, coming from Celtic is probably ridiculously a big club at that time in Europe yeah. and the world. To be fair, yeah, and then going to Blackburn were relatively unknown, yeah, throughout the world. And to be fair, I'm not that big a club in terms of. Modern history, but yeah, big, well, big at the time I was at Celtic, they were actually struggling at the time. They were like getting average gets of 17, 18,000. Yeah. They were going through a really bad spell at the time, and it was before the new the new stadiums all been done and stuff. And it was tough times at Celtic then. And um, to be fair, Blackburn was a was, was a team on the up. You know, mm-hmm. Jack Walker just yeah. came over, and they've just been promoted. And you know, obviously, as you say, not worldwide, people wouldn't have heard of them. But you know, this the year first year I was there. I think they won the league or the second mm-hmm. year. You know, not that I was played any part in that, but just to be there and a part yeah. of it all, you know, was was was, was a good experience and. You know, Kenny Douglas is you know, one of the best managers I've, I've ever worked for, and mm. and you know, lots of time for Kenny. And I was buzzing, obviously, when he when he when he come and and, mm. and offered me the contract to, to come to Blackburn. Is there a massive difference between him and Liam, him Brady? The only thing with Liam is only there the first year, and then he got sacked at, Newcomb, at, um, at Glasgow Celtic, and then Lou McCarry took over the second right. year. So it was Lou McCarry that uh, sort of left, and then not Liam Brady, you know. So um, so Lou was a desperately into fitness when he. Yeah, yeah, I used to see him on a Thursday and he used to run the lads around the track just and get medicine balls out mm-hmm. and start, yeah, very much so and um, I didn't agree with him, probably still don't agree with but, you know, every manager's different I suppose. Mm. Well then you've got to get your head around working with managers, haven't you? Yeah. So what would Lou do on a Saturday different to Liam, for instance? Well, I wasn't, his goalkeepers. I wasn't really involved in the first team when I was at Celtic racing, mm. I, was, I was pretty much with the youth team and I didn't really get involved, I was, I was sub three times I think for the first team and that was the second year. Um, I was a sub for one of the old firm games, which was a bit of a fifty-two thousand mm-hmm. yeah. um, at at Parkhead, and I was only seventeen at the time, so that was a bit nerve-wracking to be honest. And uh, yeah. we actually be- lost the game, but um, good, great experience looking back now, you know. But I, I wasn't too much in the first team setup, you know, to to, mm-hmm. to speak about what Liam was like and what Lee was like. So Kenny, mm-hmm. different kettle of fish, five sides. Yeah, Kenny was brilliant. Yeah, I mean, one of the best bit of advice I probably had in, in my life and for goalkeeping was, you know. You know, it comes to media and different things is, you know, don't get carried away with you know people writing good stuff and mm-hmm. and don't don't get too low and you know if you make a mistake and somebody's hammering you. In fact, he said, don't even read it. He said because what's the point? You know, you know you've mm-hmm. you know you've had a bad game or you've made a mistake. Then there's no point in reading some guy the next day who's never played goals before or telling you mm-hmm. what you should or shouldn't have done. You know, and I've always sort of kept that on board and you know I think it's great advice. Um, and, and you know Kenny was Kenny's been great for me. So what was the difference in your in your training styles? So the difference in training and nutrition? Well, when I went to Blackburn then it was full time training as well. Mm. And Terry Gennel was the goalkeeping coach who, who trained every day obviously. Right. And I got to work with Tim Flowers, Bobby mm. Mims, um, we're all there, Frank Talley, Italian goalkeeper uh, Australian goalkeeper and there was a good group of keepers there mm. and it was a great experience for me. Obviously Tim was England's first choice keeper at the time and mm. you know, he's he was really on top of his game and you know, to train with him every day was a was, was a fantastic learning curve for me and a great mm. experience as well and and as I said before, Terry Gannon is one of the best best coaches I've worked mm. for, you know, and um, I've got lots of time for him, and he's you know really enthusiastic about 
you know, he's, he's training and, and his goalkeeper as well. So the difference between Tim and Packy Bonner, training wise? Um, there was different things, yeah. I mean, Packy used to do this thing, I think it was either a Thursday or Friday, and just little springs into the, you know, the post and stuff, mm -hmm. and then mid-height and dive into the corner and top corners and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, he would do that religiously, you know, every Thursday or Friday, I can't remember what the exact date was now, but it's like, probably in his pre-game psychological thing, you need, need to do this every week, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then Tim was of the, he, he used to do this thing, turn off the post thing, which I kind of do now as well, and, you know, before every game as well, little drills, mm -hmm. you know, really sharp stuff, turn off the post from maybe 12 yards, and people lamping balls at him, and, you know, half a goal and things yeah. like that, and just to just sharpen reflexes up, and, and Tim used to work extremely hard he'd go out first out and last in you know and, and, and looking back now I think probably too hard because you know his body's you know and I know we're all bodies all going to be bits when we finish playing but you know he, he if it was a day off or sometimes you need a recovery day to let your body recover then he'd be in doing an hour and a half on his own with the goalkeeper and it just I think in the long run didn't didn't stand him in good stead because he, he picked up a lot of injuries towards the later part but of his do you think then that your advice you get as you go along, the rest is just important as anything yeah, else. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But a lot of goalkeepers I've found is, if they don't do the amount of work that they think they should do, yeah. mentally, it's a real turn off for them. Yeah. Because you think they have to do that amount of work all the time. Yeah. So if you went and did a, this is why I think Tony Gennell's clever, if you go and do a short session with them, yeah. it puts them mentally at a disadvantage for someone like Tim. Yeah, yeah. Because he can't cope with that. Yeah. You can't cope with not doing the amount of work. So if you yeah. say, "Well, just do twenty shots and go in," yeah, he'd find that really difficult to cope with, wouldn't he? Would yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. you might find that's only twenty shots is enough for me. Yeah, yeah. I think it's especially when you get older as well. Obviously, I'm thirty-five yeah. now, and when you get older, you do have to conserve you know energy, yeah. conserve energy. You say for match day, that's the mm -hmm. most important thing. I think it's basically taking over during the week and 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 you know not doing too much because mm -hmm. it's all about what happens on a match day. And, and I think when you're younger, you. 10 years you can work a lot lot harder but it's, I think it's about keeping the sharpness there for the, for the game. So that's why that's why I could keep coming back to the same coaching. Now if you're coaching you and Tim yeah. and somebody else you've got four different personalities. Yeah, maybe different age groups as well. And different, yeah. yeah, and you might have to levels. go with Tim go, see this is you know, what anybody reads or anybody watches it is, mm. we think well, you have to train really hard every single time you train. You don't do you? No, I don't, is, I is don't it, think so. Because you've got to know the, the mentality of the goalkeepers. Yeah. Some will love it and you can push them over the edge and burn them out. Yeah. Some will you'll have to do it mentally just to keep them in the right frame of mind mm. and in their zone. And the other ones, you can basically say, right, well, that's it. We'll do half an hour and you're, and you're quite happy. Bobby Mims yeah. was one of the worst trainers I've ever met in my yeah, life. Yeah. So he was quite happy to do 20 minutes and go in. Yeah, yeah. But on a game, he could turn his mind onto it. Yeah, I did. No, I did. But with Tim, it was slightly longer. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. more intense. Yeah. And what are your things didn't go his way in his warm yeah. things like that. Yeah, I think it's getting a balance. I think he can, yeah. he definitely can do too much. And obviously, I think Mims might have took it to the other level. I yeah. Used to, I used to warm up as a reserve, the reserve team when he played in the mm -hmm. reserves. And kick off at about seven o'clock at 20 to seven. He'd come walking onto the pitch with a coffee in his hand <laughs> still. Do like six volleys, a couple of crosses from each side, two kicks, and walk back in again. <laughs> you know, that'd be him. Yeah. But that mentally, he was prepared. Yeah, he was prepared, yeah. So, you know, when you do. Because you've gone a little at a stage further than Mimsy did, international level. Yeah. Do you think the way you've gone about it mentally has made a difference? Yeah, look at Tim. I think Tim Tim was never going to last for England. Yeah. Which was far too intense. Mm. And probably took a bit too much criticism off other people. Yeah. And when he'd read it and he'd, he'd take it to heart. Yeah. And have to work harder to get out of what he think. Well, you know, if he was in a rut, he'd work harder and harder. Yeah. But sometimes you take a step back. Yeah. But Mimsy was trying to get him to work a little bit harder. Yeah. But with you, obviously, you, you've trying to find a balance. Yeah, I think. You've gone to international level, mm. and you know when you go away with Ireland, yeah. you're not going to train as intensely, are you? No. So it's, it's trying to retune your mind into ready for Wednesday, so you might not do that much. Yeah. So if you've got someone like Tim who wants to work and work and work, yeah. as a manager, you're thinking, well, is he going to get injured before Wednesday because he's yeah, bonkers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's doing that much work, or can you retune your mind in a short space of time? So I to go out to you, I need to just calm down this down. Yeah. As long as I'm right for Wednesday, because yeah. that's what I want to be. Yeah. So I think I do think a lot. As you say, it's probably a mental, a mental thing. Then you got you got to, you know, explain to Tim or an or goalkeeper, however, that you know sometimes less is more because the most important thing is you're you're, you know, fit and ready for the game and. Mm. You know, you you can't be doing two and a half hours a day before a game, and then you know be totally fine the next day. I mean, it's, it's about taking over the day before a game, for example, like and, and, and getting the right balance. Mm. But you know, you work with some goalkeeper coaches, or you've seen some, or you've heard some. Mm. But if you're not sick, they're not happy. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree with that. Though. No, so you've got to be a balance. Well, it's, I think it's really important for people who read this and, and watch it. Mm. Is is that you've got to find a fine line, and you've got to know where 
you are in the week. Yeah. You've got to know where you are in the month. You've got to know yeah. where you are in the season. Because you've got to manage your body and manage your goalkeeper all the way through the season. Yeah. And they all say, what you said there about being sick and stuff. I mean, I, I, don't, I just totally disagree with that altogether. I mean, if you want to do a fitness thing, then then sometimes you can be sick just doing purely fitness. But if, mm. if a goalkeeper and coach or whatever is, is is having the goalkeeper flying up and down around the goal everywhere, every session, then you, you're going to get so many bad habits because you're you're knackered at the end of it and you're just doing things that you wouldn't normally do, you know? Mm. And if, I really think if you keep, keep the drills short and sharp, then the quality stays there and you don't get bad habits because when you're flying about the goal trying to keep balls out like 10 balls in a row or something then I just think you, you, you get bad habits and if you do that every day then you know the goalkeeper's not going to improve. I do think you get that with really inexperienced coaches mm. where they come in they're really keen yeah. and they want you to be seen to be doing something mm -hmm. and I've worked with some managers that if I'm not making a goalie dive about my like mad yeah. he's not happy because he doesn't think you're doing the work because yeah. I, th I still think I don't know whether you agree is goalkeeper is 90% mental and 10% physical yeah is that you, you can't play without your brain. Yeah, I know. It's and I feel like if that's gone, because everybody's fit nowadays, aren't they? Yeah, I know. The difference for me that separates you from somebody lower down is your brain. Yeah. And that's yeah. got nothing to do with fitness. I know. And the other thing as well, goalkeeping coaches probably do 80%, maybe 90% of them mm. with your hands and 10% with your feet. Mm. And you go into a game, it's probably 80% if you need your feet yeah. and 20% with your hands, mm. you know what I mean? Because the way that the rules have yeah. changed and all that kind of stuff. but. You know why shouldn't the training be adapted to that? And, and some days you might not even need your gloves. Is, is doing drills with your feet even? Mm. But it's just looking and it's learning, isn't it? Mm. And it's what you've learned. It's, it's how you can show. Up. It's what you can give to somebody else. Mm -hmm. it? And if you're a young coach and you haven't experienced what you've experienced, yeah, it's quite difficult for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then you go along to your coaching badges, mm. and they do all the drills and they do everything. Yeah. Don't they? And they don't, but they don't tell you about the other bits that really matter. Yeah. But the rest is really important. Yeah. What you do is really important. Whether mm. you've been to school and done double PE, then come to you. Yeah, it's right, really yeah. important. Yeah. But I do think the one thing that they all miss out on is the mental side of it. Yeah, big time, yeah. If you, you say it's a lonely position sometimes, like. It's a, but it's the only yeah. one you play with, well, it is up to your brain. Because mm. you make all them decisions in a split second, don't you? Yeah. And yeah. your concentration has to be really good. So there's lots of things mentally, I think it's more mental position than Anybody gives you credit for it. Yeah, me. definitely. Well, any, any, more mental position than any position in the pitch, if you ask me. I mean, it's, mm. you do have to be so mentally strong to, to be a goalkeeper. And, mm. you know, if you can teach that at a young level, then great. So, how would you get that into your training? Difficult one to actually go He wouldn't do it on the training pitch, I don't think. I think it's, it's I think, possibly work, even working with a psychologist or even, as I say, I've read some books on, on different people and different psychology type things. I think that's, I don't know if there's too many goalkeeping specific books out there or whatever, no. but I do believe that. There is a, f there is a, you know, a, a window for for goalkeeping psychology and and, and, and mm -hmm. a psychologist itself. But mm -hmm. then, you know, that's maybe me saying that, and then you, you interview an old goalkeeper next week and say, oh, I wouldn't speak to a psychologist. That's just pie in the sky stuff. You know what I mean? I don't think there's any right or wrong way. If you're super confident and you think you're the best or or, or whatever, then you don't need that one. I'm not going to say you need it. But, but you're not going to last long. Well, I don't know. I think I think if that's going to help you even an hour yeah. percent or two, then why not take it on board? So if you, if, so for me, if you say no to something, mm. you're shutting an avenue down that way you could. Yeah, definitely. Obviously, in, in the magazine, they've got their own psychologist, so they do put in hints, yeah. hints and tips for, mm -hmm. for goalkeepers. I think it's important, yeah. I do. I think, I think it's more important now than ever before. Yeah. And I, I do think it's some way you've got to get it into training, whether you work on their confidence, yeah. whether you do these sessions as really short and sharp to make it realistic like a match. Because I think sometimes, and you've done it, I've done it with some people, Let's do 20 top corners. Well, yeah. I don't happen in the game, does it? Yeah, no, yeah. So do you, do you try and make it as realistic as much tempo as you possibly can and do short, sharp? Yeah. And to sort of train your brain to go, right, well, we're going to do 10 seconds working and out, 10 seconds working out, 10 seconds working out. Yeah. So you do it like that rather than me go, right, well, we're going to do 20 of these, 20 of them. No, yeah. Well, 20 can take a bad goal a minute and two minutes. No, no, yeah. You don't work for that long in the, in the sessions, do you? No, never. So I think you've got to take it back to make it as realistic as you can as a young goalie. Yeah. And try and train your brain without them knowing. Yeah. Yeah. So you train the brain to switch on and off by doing the sessions yeah, really yeah. short and sharp. Yeah. So it's different for you because you're at that level now where you know you know what you're doing with your head. Yeah. yeah. When you're younger, it's just trying to train them unconsciously. Yeah, not to try and get them yeah. up and down, up and yeah. down, switch on, switch off. Because as you say, it's very explosive goalkeeping. It's not. Yeah. You know, you don't. You're not going to get twenty shots in a row. in again. It's never going to happen. If you are, you're relegated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really. it's like it's the, having the as you say, yeah. switching off for them a couple of yeah. seconds when you make the save. And, so I do think you can get that into your training if you're realistic enough to think about it 
and not just do the drills for the sake of doing the drills. Yeah. It's to do it with a, a game in mind and make it as much realistic as you possibly can. Yeah. So that to me is short chat and get out. Yeah. And then make sure the next one can go in. So you, the time he's resting, <coughs> it'll be like a game and you're back in and, yeah, it's, yeah. and you're back to work. Yeah, so I, do, I do think there's a lot you can actually put into it. Yeah. And I think that's that's one when I looked at most of the goalkeepers thinking, well, actually, you could be doing with that. Mm-hmm. And to be fair, you, you want to be lively when you get the ball, don't you? Yeah. So it's no good dragging it on, dragging it on, because you, you uh, end up getting tired. Yeah. And I looked at some of the body languages of the goalies in the league, and it takes so long to get up. Yeah. You, think, oh, you look absolutely knackered. Yeah, no. I think I, I totally agree. I just, I just totally disagree with people who hammer goalkeepers and mm. and just like as you said, they're being sick or whatever. Or they're just knackered, and then they're just you're just losing all the the thing you're supposed to be, you know, where your hands should be, where your mm. your you know your feet shoulder width apart, all, all the mm. basics of goalkeeping. You, you, it just goes out the window because you're you're you're, you're breathing that heavy, and you, you just lose all all, yeah, the, all the things you're supposed to do. Like. Massively under pressure to to perform for somebody who really should know better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so how long did you stay at Blackburn for? Blackburn for three years. Um, they offered me new contracts. I think contracts. But they offered me new contract as well. And I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to stay because you know Tim was. I was number two then in the third year. I didn't want to stay as a number two. I wanted to. I wanted to play. I wanted to be number one. You know, I had some. I went on loan when I was at Blackburn. I went to Swindon first, and then I went to Sunderland mm-hmm. for three months. We won the league, at the championship. When I was at Sunderland, which was yeah. which was great. Uh, you know, great experience for for. For me, as a goalkeeper, to play in front of the crowds mm-hmm. and having the pressure of obviously playing in the league and whatever, and, and didn't have that before, so that was a great experience. And then I think you get a taste for that, and you, you want more of it, you know, the, the buzz of playing in front of people and, and on being on TV or whatever, you know, just to be out there. And, and I wasn't going to get that at Blackburn because you know Tim, as I say, was really on top of his game, and mm-hmm. you know I, I wanted to leave because you know my contract was coming to an end. I thought it's a good time now to, to go. And did your routine change much going to Sunderland? Um, I still train a couple of days at Blackburn and then I went up probably on the Wednesday and trained a couple of days at Sunderland but not really I think it was just the big thing for me when I went to Sunderland alone from Blackburn was was you know I was doing alright at Blackburn whatever but mm. I think it was making the next step now you know you're doing right for the reserves or the 18 mm. or whatever it was but now it's, can you make the next step and play in front of crowds because that brings a different kind of pressure you know we yeah. come back to the mental side of things and you know are you still focused on what you need to do as a goalkeeper, or are you sort of looking around and thinking, "What the hell, I can't play in front of all these yeah. people"? Do you know what I mean? So, for me, you know, that was a, a fantastic experience, and, and I done well. You know, we took like eleven clean sheets or twelve and seventeen games at Sunderland, and things couldn't have went any better, really. And I suppose that gave me the belief and, and the confidence to to want to want more of that and, and, mm. and to go on and as they left back on that. It's a really good position to be in, but really frustrating. <laughs> It is. It was when I, when I went there and came back, and I was back on the bench yeah. again, and I was like, I don't really like this. You know what I mean? So, so was that frustrating because you could knew you could do as well as what he could? Yeah. Or well, you just wanted to taste it. it was a bit of both, innit? Yeah, you wanted to play basically. Mm. You know, I don't like these, these guys who sit sit on the bench or are quite content with not mm. not playing. You know what I mean? Because you've got one life, you've got one career, and you've got to make the most of it. And, mm. and I was, I wanted to play more. You know, uh, you get the bug, you get the excitement of, of playing, and you wanted more of that. So what would be your normal match day routine? Normally, I mean, would, it, would it be the same today as it was then? Uh, pretty much, yeah. So. Um, can't even remember then, to be honest, but basically the last number of years that I can remember is I try and stick to the same routine. Which is? So Which take is. us away, you get what time do you get up in the morning? Um, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday morning, what yeah. time do you get up? Are you a late one, but you get up at uh, 11 or yeah? Uh, about 9, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock maybe, it depends. I was only to wake up earlier, but try to go back to sleep for a bit. But yeah. Nine or ten, we have a bit light breakfast just, and then. So take us through what you eat, because I'm sure <laughs> most of them people would be interested in what you eat and what you don't do. Because it, that, that does it seems. I, I only had spaghetti because pe- I read to my way out except we had spaghetti. Yeah. He didn't yeah. tell me he didn't get out of a tin, but yeah, yeah. I didn't mind out of a tin. <laughs> Things change, I think, over the years. Mm-hmm. I used to eat chicken and beans always before a game. Yeah. Well, maybe not change that much because Saturday morning, for example, I'd have porridge in the morning, nine o'clock, say, and mm. a cup of tea or something, and then 11 30, they'd have pre match because the game said free. Mm. Um, and have chicken and beans maybe and a slice of brown toast or something like that. I wouldn't even be that hungry because I'm just not that long after breakfast, but it's just you'd be you'd be hungry before the game if you didn't yeah. eat then, you know. So So fluid intake, what would you have in the mornings? Lots of I have a few barocas, I don't know if you know what Baraka is, but you know yeah, the tablet yeah, dissolve yeah. into the thing, have it probably a couple of them before games and just basically water and stuff just to mm. hydrate and Lamy the fitness guy gives out these Lucas aid hydration sachets you pour into water and stuff, but I think it's just making sure you're fully hydrated before the game. And then make this see, I, see, I find that quite odd. Something well, if you've trained all, all week, yeah, 
and you've got fitness people here, why aren't you hydrated? Yeah, but they don't follow you home and, and see what you're drinking no, and eating no, at home. Sure. That's the okay. problem, like, because we do urine tests on day before games and stuff right. as well. And, you know, I think basically it should be between well, 100 and 300. And like last week, for example, I came in and was eating 890 or 900 or something, you know. Yeah. And the day before, obviously, after training, I just didn't drink enough fluids and stuff. No. So it's, it is a good way of finding out if you're, because yeah. then you're more sub sub subject to picking up injuries if you're not hydrated yeah. and stuff. So And mentally shy of it. All that, yeah, drains you as well, you know. So all that Friday, I was, I was putting mm. loads of fluids in. And then on Saturday, I was totally rehydrated. So you know? most, of, most of your build up, because it's quite important, because I see loads of. Loads of kids on the way to games with bottles and bottles of Lucas Aid. Mm, no. Right, which is full of sugar, you know, yeah. get up and down. Yeah. So, so just to make sure, so you would only drink probably water to kick off, wouldn't you? Yeah, water with, with possibly Barocan or, yeah. or a Lucas Aid sachet, you know. I wouldn't yeah. be drinking fizzy drinks at all. No. 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 Yeah, you see them all. Huh? Yeah. The all turn with Lucas Aid and Mars bars. Lucas Aid and Mars bars. You say the sugar rush and stuff. And yeah, and you haven't actually done anything. You know? Yeah. To what? To lose any fluid, have you really? No. No. Before you do your warm up, yeah. Would you change yours? Would you drink more Lucas Aid in the warm up than you would? Ah, oh, just basically take a bottle out with me, like a yeah. Lucas Aid light thing, and just mm. have a few sips of that during the warm up. Wouldn't yeah. even do a full bottle, to be honest, and then no. a few more sips when you get back in after your warm up, and, and hopefully ready to go. So what about half time? Do you eat your half time? No, don't eat no. No. No, just some more fluids or something. Not 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 gallons, just a few sips of maybe Lucas Aid or whatever, no. water even whatever. No, no tea, coffee. No. 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 The odd, the odd day before a game, I'd have a tea for sitting about and changing. Mm -hmm. I might have a cup of yeah. tea or something, but I wouldn't have it at half time, no. No. Oh. So that's changed massively, really, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I know. I was standing a cup of tea at half time. And, yeah. Um, so then straight away, you finish the game, you do your cool down. Mm. And then, you, then what do you eat? Do you have a period where you have to eat with a certain amount of time, or do they give you something in the dressing room? There is food in the dressing room, yeah. I think it's important. I think they say within half an hour you're supposed to get some mm. stuff back in, you know, because it's the it's, uh, high. You know, if you put it's out that window much, to window yeah, if you put stuff yeah. into those, well, I think it's quite high carbohydrate pizzas and stuff, and chicken and wraps and things, just to just to get something back into, and then you'd have dinner later when you get home or whatever. So, you know? do you find that hard to eat after match? Uh, not too bad, no, because no. you're hungry at half eleven, then you finish maybe half five. You know what I mm. mean? So it's a bit of a stretch between them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem eating that. And then your routine during the week now at the moment. Monday morning, you coming in. Monday, well, if you came on a Sunday? Saturday, some would normally probably train Monday, Tuesday, and. Normally break the week up, we'd have a Wednesday off, train Thursday, mm -hmm. Friday, and, and game Saturday, like so. So you know, you obviously a strict diet. Mm. Yeah. So what mental work did he do with you, and what physical work did he do with you during the week? Mental work. I do a lot of myself, but we do. Mm. The docs brought in this, this which is quite the last few months here at the club is this eye specialist from from Ireland. Right. It's like the there's a reaction board, the lights come on and stuff, and. Yeah. and you know, I've been getting more and more into that and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a number you've got to get within a minute and many lights you knock out and stuff right. and it's been improving and improving so you can see that that's, yeah. so we're working on that, different stuff in the gym, pre-activation stuff, we do yoga every morning 9.30 yeah. for 30 minutes and um, generally go out 15 minutes early with the, with the goalkeeping coach and the other goalkeepers playing mm -hmm. two touches, just basically yeah. a bit of fun to, to start the session off and, mm -hmm. then, and then we train. So your specific days with Tenny Gennon would be what? So the day would be out probably quarter past 10. As I say two touch for 15 20 minutes and then whatever Terry's set out that day to work on then we would you know build into that if we're mm -hmm. doing angles and stuff we'd, we'd start with basic handle and build up to to you know maybe start in the middle of the goal moving to the side and, and, and different shots from different angles if we're doing a crossing session we'd we build up a little throws just to get you off the, off the mm -hmm. ground and, and build up to people crossing balls on and with bodies in the box and things. Is there anything you hate? No, not really. No, I don't. I don't really hate. And I, I, what I hate before is what you said about the physical side of things. You know, and probably because you're older now and more experienced, you can you can talk about it more. But when you're a yeah. kid, it was like you must do this, and it was like you didn't know any different. And you go right, I have to do this because yeah. this is what he's saying. You know, and and looking at it now, I just think it's it's totally the wrong thing to do, even at, at, for kids level, because you have to work. But I think, as I say, to keep to keep your quality right, then you've you've got to be, you know, yeah. not breathing out your backside, is it? <laughs> So, so would you sit, I know I've talked to you before, but yeah. would you sit down and begin the season with your coach and go, right, this is what I think I can do. Yeah. What do you see in me? How can I improve? And then set yourself targets through the game or through the season. Yeah, I think you do profiles in a sense at the start of the season, maybe it's after halfway through the season and on where you think you need to improve. Like, you know, like mm -hmm. for example, my left foot needs to improve, you know, because of the back mm -hmm. pass and different things, which it has improved, but there is still room for improvement. 
So during the course of the week, we would do some work on my left foot to improve it from the week before or the day before or whatever. And little things like even throwing the ball out, just basic goalkeeping stuff where you've marked yourself out of 10, say at the start of the season, you know, revisit that after six months and see have you improved on it. And hopefully you have. And if you haven't, then you need to work more. And even if you have improved, you see the improvement in the mark you give yourself. And you know you can be better again, yeah. so which is important. As long as you're not too hard on yourself. No, I don't think you're too hard on yourself. But the other thing that that's back to how many games you have. Mm. If you're away with Ireland, if you're, yeah. you know what I mean. So a, a lot depends on that as well. But if you have a free week, then I think it's important that you can have that window to improve on, say your left foot, for example. So the, the other thing you've got to look at that and think, well, I tell you what, you've now come to Aston Villa and working on your left foot. Yeah. How many coaches have you had before that? We've not seen that. Yeah, no, to, to be fair, well, the one, the one in Man City was different because he was Italian and didn't really speak yeah, but English. You, but, but, you, but even for kids and even for coaches out there, mm. you know, you've, got to, you've got to look at what you've got, yeah. make an assessment, yeah. and then go from there. Because yeah. you've been to Celtic, you've been to Blackburn, yeah. been to Man City, yeah. and you're still trying to improve your left foot. Yeah, no, yeah. And then maybe if somebody had sat down with you early on and gone, right, Let's look at you, Shay, as Shay. Yeah. Like, what are your weak points? What are your good points? Right, okay. Yeah. You've identified your left foot. Because your left foot, if it's improved now, it must be rubbish back then, to be fair. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> ten, 10 years ago, you could hardly stand on my left foot. Yeah, you know, so, so. so, and I know the back pass rule came in and made you. Yeah. But you think that somewhere, somewhere along, picked up on that. Yeah, I know, yeah. Maybe you should have done that a lot earlier and you would have been better. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying about the coaching, it's just like identifying what. Yeah, you've got to adapt a little bit, you know, to what the strength of the, the individual goalkeeper is, I suppose, mm. that you're working with. And the way the game changes. Yeah, definitely. Because the game's changed massively. I mean, even now, apart from back passes, I mean, the balls you use now, are, are, mm. you know, when you played and when I even started, I mean, the, the, the much they move now and stuff, whereas, mm. you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you would have tried to catch a lot more and that would be the dumb thing. And even now, you still try and catch it, but because they move so much more now, you've got to do a bit more training on, on, on where you bang the ball because, yeah. you know, the balls are can do so much in the air, you know, and, and, and so, people so, who not, wasn't yeah. the goalkeeper probably don't understand that, you know. So would you would you stay further on your line now than you ever did before? Possibly, but it's just trying to get that balance, you know, because mm. I watch goalkeepers and videos and watch, you know, some of the best, whatever people call the goalkeepers in the world. And, you know, you look at some, they're on the six yard box making saves and you look at somebody like I know who's retired, but Oliver Kahn, who's mm. basically on his line making saves, you know. I was thinking because because the ball moves. Yeah, you've got more time to, to, to react. Yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Is more. I think it's key not to get too far down the line. You see some goalkeepers as people's hitting it are still trying to get down the line of the, yeah. the ball and setting and diving back because they're not set, you know what I mean? It's so important that you're set wherever you are in the goal, even be at the right position or the wrong position. But I do believe if you can be a, a yard you know, to your line, closer to your line, and you do have more time, especially with the new balls, because they, mm. they do move a lot more. The only other side of the coin is the closer you get to the line and the less window is for, you know, if you mishandle yeah. one or whatever, then yeah. you've, you've got less chance of, of maybe reacting to the second one. So it's a balance act between Yeah, them. yeah. I think it's not getting too close, like I think like Oliver mm. Kahn, who was one of the best goalkeepers in the world, bear in mind, mm. I thought was too close to his line and then I'm trying to think who's someone who, you know, was, who's very far down the line perhaps, it's just mm. getting the balance in between. Yeah, so it's, so it's difficult again to replicate that with kids, isn't it? Because the balls are used different again. Yeah, I know. So when you come to that, so yeah, I look at that, I how, how often do you examine your game? So you come in on a Monday, you go, right, okay, blah, 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 whatever, we need to fix this or we need to look yeah. at this. How often do you say, well, Major change, or the ball's been a major change. Yeah. But the size of the players have been a major change as well, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Because the players have all got bigger. Yeah, fitness as well. They're more physically yeah. stronger. So when would you say actually look? In your mind, the game's changed. Saturday, that didn't work. I mean, how soon did you start adapting to that new ball? So obviously, you're looking at reaction time. Yeah. You're looking at different things. And how, how, how often do you actually sit down and think about this? Is what I need to think about. Um. Or do you do it on a constant basis, sort of weekly basis? Probably a weekly basis, yeah, I don't think you, you can be sitting 24-7, you know, you've got to switch off no, as well, yeah, but I think it's, yeah. it's important that you revisit different things and look at some video footage of what you've done, or, mm. or which I always think is really important, is watch all the goalkeepers, what they've yeah. done, and, mm. and, and try and learn from, from, from individuals, and be your own goalkeeper, have your own style, yeah. but, you know, little things that, you know, you might have done in your days that mm. I would have looked at and thought, oh, bloody hell. You know, if we could take that on board, then mm. you know, little things like that. I think you can take little bits of everybody's you, game on board. You just pinch your things, don't you? Yeah, to try and improve mm. yourself. Then mm. you know, because you're never the finished article. You're always trying to improve and be better. Because huh? I looked, I looked at all the Premier League goalies and I looked at all. I think if you were the outside of your foot, it's a natural curve. Mm. If you were the inside of your foot, it's a natural curve. 
So the only problem you'd have as a goalkeeper now for me as a modern one yeah. is three, are you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I wouldn't bother about the side, I'd just work for a lot. Oh, yeah. Just that, that window around you, about probably two or three foot either side of you. Yeah. And then where and how. So I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that people don't go and meet the ball yeah. with their fists. Yeah. They go to, it comes to them and do that. Mm. I'm just wondering how the first one's going to be actually to go that way. Yeah. So you get you use the ball. So I look at that window and thinking, well, if that was me, I'd be working all day on that. Mm. Now because I can deal with a natural curve, yeah. both sides. So yeah, I'm not yeah. worried about that. I'm only yeah. worried about that. Yeah. I I don't agree with people who do that with their fists either. I'm very much of the opinion yeah. of keeping your hands open and, and buying it because you obviously you've got a bigger surface mm. and the balls do move so much. Now. Mm. Like I can bang a ball probably as far with this part of my hand mm. as I can punch yeah. it. Like you know, and and I think it's important. I think especially for kids because you can do that and miss it. Do you know mm. what I mean? Because yeah. your your hands that size mm. compared to that size yeah. are. It's twice as big, you know, and I think young kids, you know, you look at the people like maybe the game, people like that who have a habit of, you know, yeah. punching things mm -hmm. and even making saves like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can make a save like that as, as easy as you can make a save like that, I think, and it's, there's more for the ball to hit, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you can still, you can still bang it out for a flow if you, if you, if you get the right connection. Mm. Cross is different now? Cross is different. I think that the quality of, of every Premier League team, I would say, has got a, Specialist mm. guy who can cross a ball, yeah. you know, from set plays, corners. Mm. You know, it's probably going back to even Pat Jennings. You know, the the, the days of the ball just being hung up in the box yeah. and and keeper coming and, and picking up. Or, or you get the odd one again. Don't get me wrong, but every team in the Premier League nearly have a have an expert on on set plays and corners and free kicks and 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 the amount of crosses you can come for now are, are, are I think a lot less than what you could for you know ten years. This, is, this years is where I have a problem with looking for six or five goalies. Yeah. Because I just don't think it's it's a natural it's a natural movement for the goalkeeper of six or five to come for a cross in the Premier League today. Yeah. Because he normally crosses the ball that's no. seven foot eight foot, do they? No, never really. Well, the odd time is the same, but but it's a, it's a bad ball. Yeah. But normally because of that good. Quality, yeah. And do you, do you think the height of the goalkeepers will change? They'll go back to like the like the like the Swansea room. Yeah. He's a diver, and just before you're not even the biggest diver, yeah. are you? Yeah. So it's more natural for you to go that way. Yeah up to meet the ball than it is for them to go down. Yeah, no, yeah. So I, do, I, do, I look at them and I see them having problems and thinking, maybe goalkeepers can have another shift where they're looking for six foot goalies. Yeah. Because they ain't going to change the size of the goals, are they? Yeah, no, yeah. Not for a long time. Yeah. Whether it be more of your size. Yeah. And less of the Peter checks. Yeah. I think when the goalkeepers are so big as well, they, they, they get tend to come for crosses that they shouldn't be coming for and then they get caught mm. out because yeah. of the size. And the, the, the problem they do have then is the quality of the ball. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter if you're six foot five or six foot, then if the quality of the ball is, it doesn't matter who's in goal, that you, some balls you can't get. You know what I mean? And, and the, the bigger guys sometimes get drawn into things that they can get and they, and they can't then get found out in that sense, you know? And this goes back to decision making. One of the most important things of a goalkeeper is, is decision making, yeah. be that shot stopping, crosses, through balls, whatever. Mm. It's, a, it's one of the biggest attributes a goalkeeper needs. I do, I do think it's, it's changed slightly, goalkeeper, and it'll change again, won't it? Because mm. you have to be better technically with your feet now, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And you deal with less. I think I think some of the goalkeeping bits will die off. Yeah. Because the crosses are different now. Yeah. Probably through balls and probably are slightly harder now because people drop to the edge of the box. Yeah. So it's going to be shots from outside the box and really set pieces. Mm. They're the two main things that I think a goalkeeper is now going to have problems with. Yeah. There's nobody crosses the ball from deep anymore apart from really? Blackburn. Yeah. And Stoke. They're yeah. the only two teams that play that way now. Yeah. So goalkeeping is evolving that way that. Because teams drop deep, you'll have different problems because it must be less physical for you now than it was before. Yeah, because yeah, you, so, yeah. you don't get smashed anymore, do you? Yeah, no. Very rarely. So, so your game must have developed subconsciously, really, mustn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. To deal with them things, and everybody drops deep, so you'll have to go well. So maybe it's, maybe it's changed dramatically for you mm. from when you first got in the first got in the team. Yeah. Um, possibly, I don't I haven't thought about too much in depth, but I definitely believe that you know the quality in, in the Premier League and. As it has improved, there's no getting away from that, and, and the set plays mm. has improved, you know. So, in a sense, it makes it more difficult, but you've got to adapt your game mm. to, to combat that. Well, I mean, I know you've got Dunny and you've got James Hughes. Yeah. You're pretty quick, so you play a higher line, don't you? Yeah. But you don't tend to drop that deep, do you, at times? No. So, yours might be slightly different to some of the Bolton where they just drop onto the edge of the box. Even yeah. when they drop onto the edge of the box, they might let you play in front of them. Yeah. So, really, you wouldn't have that as much to do in the games. Yeah. But what you do do is vitally important. Yeah. So the pressure's probably more on you now 
for a shorter period of time, but a more important period of time, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And come back, I suppose, to what team you're in, but you know, starting positions is important where where, mm. where you relate to the back four and, and the team, you know, because some of the three balls you see the keeper stuck to his lane, and it's like, well, you should yeah. be just picking that up easier, or mm. even on the edge of your box and sweeping things with your feet, even, you know, it's it obviously it relates to where the defence are and, mm. and as a team how you've set up, you know, but I think. I've always said that in my career that I've, I've, I've always been very comfortable and confident to be on the edge of my box, you know, for free balls and, uh, and a sweeper keeper, some people call it, but, you know, I'm very comfortable with, with mm. picking balls up even inside my box or outside the box and, and, and mm. clearing your lines, which is important. See, I, I, I sometimes think that goalkeepers coming after you will struggle with that because mm. teams drop to the edge of the box. Yeah. So therefore, they have less to do. Yeah. They have less to do balls because it's only going to be a two yard ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your starting position is still vital, but it's just them little through balls, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas, you know, when I look, I look at your team, you play quite high line. What's it like playing from Republic? Is that the same? Do you play high line? Yeah, we don't, we don't generally try and draw off too deep. Yeah. Mm. Um, most teams I've played with, they've been like, been like that, you know, so it's, mm. it's important that, you know, you do, well, you need the leadership as a goalkeeper as well to, to keep them mm. away from you, you know what I mean? Because obviously, if they're back on top of you, then it makes it more difficult.